So uh, it's, it's how you go about this to create this result. And, and the key element of that uh, or a foundation of it is uh, how we interact, how we communicate. And, and the way we communicate, the, what, what she is uh, 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 addressing here as well is when we communicate to the outside world, we automatically also communicate to ourselves. And particularly our body language, which <clears throat> it's, it's very fascinating. If you, if, I need to, I need to. Is it okay if we are moving a little bit towards communication? Absolutely. I was about to say that communication and interaction skills anyway is the second key. And it's not that the keys are mutually exclusive. It could be that one is linked to the other. So good that you are already touching upon the second. So, key. so we are floating a little bit here into the next. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you think about communication and, and, and uh, uh, communication has three key elements. It's, uh, it's the content, the words that we say and use, no matter in writing or, or uh, verbally. It's the tone of our voice, which is a key element in the communication, and it's our body language, our, the way we, we act, we behave uh, when we communicate. And, and those three parameters create 100% of the impact in communication. Now, if I, if I, there's some, some research behind this, uh, and, and I can, I don't have it all top of my head, but I can provide that if anybody is interested. But there is research behind that, and uh, and um, uh, well, well, the percentages are a percent more or less here, or they are depending on who you read. In general, what do you think is the is the content, the words? What percentage of the total impact does that represent? Five to ten percent. Pardon? Five to ten percent. Very good. Actually, seven percent. So seven. you are perfectly in the range. The tone of voice is the second strongest, with thirty-eight percent. Body language is fifty-five percent. So that's the whole bandwidth. So now, when you think, if we, when we use nowadays, we are very strong in texting. And, uh, uh, and just to let you know, it's not emails. that. Just to let you know, I was able to answer it because we had covered it in one of the earlier episodes. So it's not that I am a smart one. I just remember we talked about it in okay. one of the last episodes. <laughs> so, so uh, when, when when you consider this for a moment, when we use when we use basically emails or texts, we are using only the content. We are using seven percent of the bandwidth. And, and the moment we we become verbal and uh, we, we hear people, we get almost half of the bandwidth available. But the full impact is also when when we show up as as the whole person, no matter if it's on video or but even more more impactful when it is in person. So, when, when you when you uh, take that for a moment, our body language speaks all the time. We don't have to say one single word. The way we walk into the room, the way we sit down, the way we look at or don't look at people, all of it sends signals constantly. The moment we are waking up, our body starts signaling. The way our face looks, the way we, yeah, whatever we do. And, and, and th those signals are very strong. And we need to be aware of that, that our body constantly sends out messages, even if we don't say one single word. So uh, that in itself, when we then reflect back on leadership presence, it's, it's important to recognize how are we moving? You know, mm. if I walk into the room kind of like this, 
I'm already telling everybody I'm very insecure. I probably have no clue what I'm going to do. And uh, um, I'm waiting for a beating. Not, not literally, but mm. so. At the same time, if I come into the room with my head high and uh, my shoulders open. And with a smile on my face, it's a completely different signal that I'm sending before I have even said one word. Mm. Understood, but it also leads me to two questions I am now curious about. One, Manfred, with the world becoming more and more re uh, remote work um, uh, nature, uh, where does it lead to in terms of providing leadership when uh, a lot of conversation happens over email uh, or probably phone calls? Um, some of them are video, of course, uh, but I think you would agree with me that the amount of conversation that a leader has to do nowadays or anyone, when I say leader, I'm saying all executives uh, would have to do over email is significantly higher than it was 10 years back or 15 years back. Uh, so curiosity question number one is, is around this, that uh, does it, does it, what does it mean to, to improve effectiveness on the second key, which is communication, when the contribution of content is only 7%? Okay, so, so the, the feedback that I'm giving to this uh, is valid before COVID and before remote uh, work, but it is, absolutely crucial now okay mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. nothing new in that sense but my first my first uh, challenge that i would make is uh, don't use email okay at least make a phone call or mm -hmm. have a video call technology today is different than it was 10 years or 20 years ago today it is like a phone call to open up a video call. Utilize the medium, utilize it effective. Uh, uh, focus on, on shorter meetings with one or maximum two desired outcomes. Hmm. What do I mean by that? <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you a uh, an episode out of my my learning as a uh -huh. young uh, as a young uh, uh, leader a young executive I wasn't really a leader then I, I was supposed to be but uh, uh, looking back uh, I lacked a lot and and it was interesting I was called into our headquarters group headquarters and uh, uh, I worked at them for several years and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, shortly after I, I, uh, I was there, I, uh, I called, a, called a meeting on a project that I, I was working on and uh, I also invited my boss's boss. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, he, uh, he responded to my invitation. <clears throat> Very in essence, very polite. He uh, first he, he called me. He said, "Do you have a moment? I'd like to talk with you about this meeting." So I walked over to his office and uh, and I said, "Well, uh, what can I do, Eva?" And he said, uh, "Well, Manfred, uh, I I will not come to that meeting." And there is a reason for that, and I will give you the reason. My reason is. If, if a meeting doesn't have a desired outcome at the top, uh, I'm not going to participate because I don't know how I will contrib contribute to it. And uh, uh, but if you can come up with uh, with a with a clear purpose for the meeting, with a clear desired outcome then I can make a decision if I can contribute to it and uh, uh, and how I can contribute to it and then I will certainly make an, an effort to uh, participate in the meeting. And uh, 
Uh, of course, he he's he is the loveliest. He was the loveliest person that you can can uh, think of, and he was very delicate about it and very nice about it. But uh, it was also a clear message. If you are scheduling a meeting that has just activities on it, that somebody is doing that, somebody else is doing something else, I'm not in investing my time in it. Because it's a meeting without a clear purpose, without the desired outcome. Uh, it's purely activity-based, and there may be an outcome or may not. So <clears throat> that, was, uh, that hit home with me. I really... Uh, digested that uh, and uh, uh, I started to do that systematically and I, I requested from my people to always when they schedule a meeting it has to have a purpose, a desired outcome on top and not too many because then it's uh, it's going to be a long meeting with all kinds of stuff and it's it's not good and this in our virtual world is twice as important to do that. So <clears throat> that is, is, a, is a, a key element to, to get, to, to uh, create clear communication and create effective meetings uh, because you, you, you don't have that opportunities. You have to create them where you get people together with a purpose, you clear this up, and then after the meeting, you can use your email and confirm we have decided on A, B, and C. This and, and what else are three, three bullets. That's it. So you have your written record. If you, if you do a conversation, in in writing in essence have a negotiation in writing it is very very inefficient that's when you have then those emails that are that have all kinds of stages uh, where people uh, become defensive and say well i didn't mean to say xyz because when we are writing we are not we are not using the whole spectrum we are limited to a very small bandwidth and within this bandwidth all kinds of uh, of miscommunication happens and i can give you another example for that uh, <clears throat> Raul, let's let's assume you and i read the same book we are both on page 283 Let's make another assumption that you and I are good painters. I'm not. And whatever we read on this page 283, we're going to paint a picture of that. Do you think that your picture will look reasonably similar than mine? Mm, somewhat. Well, I'll give you more information. On this page, it describes a forest on the le left side, a street along, um, uh, a, a village with a church steeple in the back, uh, and on the right side is a meadow with five cows on it. Do you think that will be a reasonably similar picture? Yeah, I see what you mean. I think uh, there would be some similarities, but uh, your choice of colors, my choice of colors could be very different. Totally. Yeah. So. Totally. Mm. It, it may resemble in the sense that there are five cars and three cars on the street, mm. and that there is some sort of a village. My church steeple may be pointed, yours may be with, a, with, a, with an onion uh, roof, or whatever it might be. Yeah. How come we read exactly the same word, the same comma, the same paragraph? How can that be? Totally identical information. Mm. It's because of our frame of reference. Mm. Our frame of reference is the 
basic overall filter how we see and recognize our world. Your frame of reference is completely different than mine. I grew up in Austria, you grew up in Canada, or in, uh, I think in, in, what did you tell me, in uh, Bangalore? Or, India. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, we have a different path through our lives. And so when we get the words in, they are, they are being perceived differently. Now think about, I'm writing you an email, and I have in my mind, when I write this, I, I, I write it with a certain picture in my, in my head. And then I send, I, I hit the send button. So you get that email the next tenth of a second, and you are reading it with creating the picture in your mind that's based on your frame of reference. It's a different picture. And that's where we start then having this talking by each other, if it's only in writing. Mm. <laughs> can, can you see the problematic in this? I do. I and, do. And, I, and recognizing that in the concept of, of interacting with people and communicating, and now in a, in a remote and, uh, and uh, a distributed work environment, it becomes absolutely crucial. Stay away from emails, use it for confirmation or to communicate facts and data and figures. But don't use it to talk with people. Lovely. And I think, thanks for that clarification through these two examples. It's not that don't use email at all, uh, but if I were to distill three messages that I could figure out in, in, in these examples, I think number one, be very, very outcome driven. If uh, if there is a meeting, if there's a conversation, it, it has to start with what is the outcome that is desired from this interaction. Uh, so that's one. Second, uh, to ensure that uh, you are able to um, uh, understand how to arrive at that outcome as a team, uh, do it live best or do it in form of a video call because like we said, uh, content is only 7%. I'll add something based on my experience. Some of the clients, they have taken this cue from Amazon, which has mastered this particular art. Whatever content is required, send it before the meeting because anything which is written can, can be received by everyone. Whatever thoughts are there in your mind that can come before. And like you, like the example that you gave, my interpretation of that content could be different than your interpretation. That is what we are going to then discuss when we are doing a live conversation. It That, that first time uh, uh, receiving your content need not happen during the meeting. It can happen before. So that's the, uh, that's the second one, that one being outcome driven. Second, uh, to arrive at uh, how to achieve that particular outcome, do the meeting live uh, or in, in form of a video call, but don't do it over email and the third message is there is a usefulness of email but it is not to do that first interaction it is to uh, to share data to share um, uh, share a, a, a plan based on what was agreed in the meeting doing follow-ups for which we need not assemble uh, everyone uh, for very very tactical things so there is a usefulness so i think i'll just qualify your message that it's not that don't use email at all but use email when uh, it it is serving a purpose email is is not a tool for all the purposes it has its its purpose so use that uh, tool selectively so i'm putting all these three in into what bucket bucket and answering my own question that um, uh, when when i asked you uh, that um, use of email has increased significantly uh, how does it fit into um, uh, into what we know about communication and interaction overall uh, and into developing leadership. So that's the answer. Thank you so much, Manfred. Uh, I'll get to my next question on this particular topic of communication and interaction, um, which I was curious when you were explaining about uh, 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 about uh, how it gets broken down into the three components. Uh, and my second curiosity was around, uh, I think these are basics. 7% content, 55% is the visual, 
these are basics this would apply for everyone is there a difference in which how someone who um uh, who is uh, in um, in a role uh, of a leader should be di- thinking differently about communication interaction compared to anyone else come again with the question i'm not sure i, I understood so if uh, when we say that communication and interaction is an important key to effective leadership is there a difference between how one would think of communication and interaction uh, outside of the construct of leadership <clears throat> i well yes uh, the, the the simple answer is yes uh, the the uh, the impact will be less problematic uh, you know when you are a leader you typically uh, when you say something when you do something when you make a decision it's typically uh, a, call it a higher value in the sense of uh, monetary or, or or physical value decision than if you are not in a leadership position of course when you are buying your first house it's a it's a huge decision for you and it can be very impactful and so how you negotiate how you interact uh, how you uh, get across with uh, uh, with those that you need to uh, to deal with uh, becomes as important so uh, <clears throat> at, the, at the leader you are always you I shall say you are always on stage. I think that is one thing you need to recognize. Understood. Understood. People Can't be selective. You, yeah. People look at mm. you uh, no matter what you do. You may not realize it, you may not see it, but they see it in in their peripheral vision and, and it is recognized. So whatever you do, uh, whatever you say, how you say it, it has a greater impact and it has uh, it has different consequences when you're not in a leadership position what you do may be very little consequential if you do the same thing as the ceo of a company or as the uh, leader of a large organization uh, it's a different ballgame got it and as you were explaining uh, i think another example was coming to my mind uh, i think uh, the forget about the title i think anyone who is in 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 a uh, in a role in which you have to move others uh, to get results uh, you are in that leadership role mm-hmm. uh, that's how i i see it and i think i partly learned from you only uh, and if if anyone is in that role then communication has communication interaction has a specific importance compared to people who are not in the role and incidentally i think uh, most of us most of us are in getting into that role earlier it used to be that there were select roles say ceo of a company uh, sales people who were in the role of moving others but now if we look at over the last few decades almost all of us have in some way moved to that that kind of a role in whatever we are doing a because industries have changed uh, economies have changed information has become uh, easily accessible so it means that everyone has got similar kind of data uh, but um, what is what is required is the ability to use that data to uh, to move others mm-hmm. whichever role we are in even in our yes. personal life i think we are playing more and more of a role of moving others whether it's our sons or daughters or it's our wife or it's our parents um, so point number 1 uh, most of us are are getting into that role point number 2 if we are getting into that role then uh, 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 importance of uh, communication and interaction has significantly increased compared to when only few of us were in in the role of moving others and point number 3 is what you said um hence constantly um our our interaction which um which could be either in form of content or body language or 
the tone of the voice would get monitored. Uh, so these are the three I would kind of put in three points uh, around answering my own question that how is it uh, is it probably different for someone who is in a leadership role and by leadership role I'm not talking about the title but the role itself of moving others. Yes. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the last part. By yeah, the way, sorry. it's a part. It's a part of the coaching uh, environment and a coaching relationship to answer your own questions. <laughs> so I think with with these interactions, I am also uh, learning it a little bit more. It's triggered. It's triggered in the coaching process mm -hmm. that you you uh, you uncover questions. And then you think it through and answer those questions for yourself. So I'm curious, Manfred, I think this was also the last part. I wanted to uh, get a little bit more detail around when you are working with any client on these two, and I want to take these two keys. What really happens? Um, uh, how can someone who is, who let's say someone like me, let's say I have a, uh, I, I have a specific goal. I want to improve my executive presence. And I want to improve on my communication and interaction skills. Uh, and I come to you. What happens after that? Can you please take take us through that? Well, uh, the first thing that we will do is is have a conversation, uh, because I will have to I will have to find out uh, where you think you are, and and where you feel you want to go. And uh, uh, in this process, uh, we will also find out. Uh, if uh, if we have uh, a good chemistry to uh, 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 work together, because a coaching collaboration is a very is a very close and very personal uh, relationship in in many ways, because uh, uh, a, 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 an effective coaching relationship is very has to be very authentic, and it has to be. Uh, a relationship where the coachee and the coach can uh, easily be vulnerable without hesitation. And uh, uh, which requires also authenticity and uh, trust building. Uh, so so that is the first the first step to find out where you are, or where you think you are, your perception, and, and where you, you think you want to go. And then we can start working on that, uh, maybe refining the, where you want to go into uh, creating absolute clarity on that, uh, and maybe challenging that, uh, that uh, target or that goal. And, and then uh, going into deeper into uh, uh, where you where you might be really, where you might really be, rather than where you think you are. Sometimes it is an accurate assessment. Most of the times it is not. And then we, in that process, we uncover certain things and uh, explore that, and uh, decide what's important and what is not, and and how to. Uh, create the plan going from here to there and working on the necessary uh, changes, improvements, enhancements. Uh, and and uh, look, it's it's not it's not only a part of is of course uh, potentially acquiring additional tools and techniques and tactics and whatever might be involved. Uh, uh, the second part of that is then also, or working on how to apply those new tools or those enha enhanced tools. And the third level then is building the necessary habits to use those tools effectively. Because by the end of the day, it's our behavior that creates our results. And our behavior is 90% habitual. So when we want to change our behavior or adjust our behavior or enhance our behavior to create new results, but we need to look at the habits, those that we have and uh, make and, and, and that help us to boost them further and enhance them further, those that we have and that are not necessarily helping us. <laughs> 
to uh, change them. And, uh, and then there are habits that with new tools or new, new ways, uh, there are habits that we don't have. So we need to initialize them and start building them and strengthening them. Because only what we do habitual, we do well. We do uh, uh, very efficient and effective. So curious, given that habit building itself is uh, not an easy thing, but one of the most powerful ways to transform. Uh, that's my personal belief as well. So do you have uh, a specific methodology um, uh, on building habits uh, that your clients benefit from? <clears throat> well, there are little, little, little tricks that you can help yourself building little crutches and reminders uh, to create repetition, to create reminders that you need, you, that you promised yourself to do X. And, uh, and uh, uh, to design for yourself uh, uh, then, then a, 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 a construct that reminds you. Uh, when you do something repetitive over, over a reasonable time, it, it gets to the point where the reminder becomes irrelevant because you don't really see the reminder anymore because you are doing. And then you have built a habit or then you have changed a habit. So it's a, and, and there are different ways of reminders. It depends what it is. It can be it can be a simple, a simple sign that you do on your notepad that you that you use, or 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 uh, a, a sticker that you have in front of you on your screen. Uh, uh, at, at a, uh, uh, where, where you have a, a word or a note or a sign or, or something that reminds you on that particular thing. So every time you glance over it, you're reminded. Oh, I need to do that. I need to do that. I need to do it. And the repetition builds the habit. Got it. And uh, for anyone who is looking to take the first step on the two keys that we talked about, uh, is there any tool uh, for assessing where someone is on presence and communication inter interaction skill that you would recommend? <clears throat> you mean an assessment tool? Uh, correct, uh, an assessment tool, yeah. yeah well, uh, look, guys, uh, with respect to, to communication and interaction, a, a tool that's very popular, it's not only for that, but uh, it has a strong uh, component for, for how we interact, how we are perceived and how we, um, yeah, how we are perceived by others and how we receive input and so on, is DISC, uh, and it's a very standard tool. Uh, it, uh, DIS, DIS, C. Uh, so uh, that's uh, probably the most simple tool. Uh, and uh, uh, look, I'm I'm not a I'm not starting with assessments uh, in that sense. I I start with questions, but there are. That's just my style. Uh, there are coaches that uh, uh, they are very effective and very successful with their clients uh, that start out with a battery of assessments to uh, kind of lay out everything. Uh, it, it, it really depends on the, on the working style. Uh, I use assessments uh, when I see fit uh, uh, along the way. Uh, others use assessments from the beginning before they even start work. I, I, there is nothing right or wrong either way. And I should. And I think uh, we have almost come to the end of this particular session. So my last question to you on these two topics, presence and uh, communication and interaction skills, uh, are there any books that are your favorites or you would recommend? <clears throat> oh. I'm thinking what what would be well. Uh, I tell you, uh, leadership uh, again. 
I I like I like uh, leadership and self deception. It's from the Abinger Institute. It's a good a good starter to uh, get a little bit of feel for leadership and leadership presence and how how a leader uh, can become more effective. I think that's a that's a very good one, but there are so many. Uh, I think that that would be a good start too. Understood. And I've read that. Uh, highly impressed by that book. So I would also highly recommend it. I think I covered it. So from my side, I'll also share two books. One is uh, Presence by Amy Cuddy. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it might not be uh, exactly where what we talked about, but it's a it's a great uh, great book written in a very simple language. I would say. For a lot of people to understand about presence and even apply it. Second book uh, related to uh, communication. Again, it's not exactly a communication book, but uh, uh, I would recommend reading "To Sell Is Human" by Daniel Pink. Uh, that book is around the topic of moving others and how everyone should be uh, adopting the the new tactics, new new ways of selling, the new ABCs of selling. Uh, the new abc's of selling are attunement buoyancy and uh, clarity uh, so it's, i would recommend that book it's actually an interesting book yes yeah <laughs> i would i would immediately put it into the uh, communication and interaction but it has certainly i mean let's face it uh, selling is influencing and influencing is communicating and yes. interacting so yes. from that perspective yes. i fully agree yeah, <laughs> all right. On that note, thank you so much, Manfred, for another very interesting conversation. We talked about two of the keys of uh, leadership. Uh, hopefully, in our upcoming sessions, we'll, we'll look over uh, the others as well. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me.